Hi Fabulous Techies, it's Anna here, bringing a touch of tech magic to bright new day. Today we kicking off the first part of our two-part series on the wild and wonderful world of files on Linux. In this part, I will dive into a theory behind the different tables. File descriptor table, the file table, and the inode table, we're going to discuss them all. And I will explain how they all work together to open and store the files. Make sure to catch part two, where we will roll our sleeves and get hands dirty with practical examples using C++. Oh, wow, I don't have any sleeves though. Anyways, grab your snacks and get ready for a tag party like no other. <laughs> that was too much. Okay. In Linux, the file is the most basic and fundamental abstraction. Linux loves to think of everything as a file, making it super versatile and easy to interact with because the file system on Linux simply looks like layer tree structure underneath the root directory. To better illustrate the inner processes between these different tables, let's just draw a diagram here. Um, let's divide our space into four sections first. Um, we can have our user space on the left side and let's keep the kernel space then on the right side. Um, this means we can leave some room for hardware section on the bottom and we will be particularly interested in the disk space of that section. So let me draw it here. All right. This picture leaves us with a little bit of space for our main program and it should be enough. Yeah. Uh, file descriptor tables, file table, and inode table, they all live in the kernel space. Let me just draw them here really quickly. Okay. Um, we will discuss them in more detail later. The picture is looking good so far. On the user space side, we have the virtual address space for our processes. Let's just put them in here. Okay, perfect. Virtual address space is the range of memory addresses that processes can use. It allows each process to operate as if it has its own isolated memory, even though the actual physical memory might be shared. Okay, and now I think we have all the pieces together and we are ready to discuss what actually happens when we open a file. To access a file, it needs to be open first, right? When we try to open a file in main, depending on whether you want to read or write to this file, it can look something like this. Let me show you. Um, let's try to open two files. Uh, first will be blue txt, and we'll say it's for writing only. And then another one can be a pink txt for reading and writing. Do you see how we use different flags for different purposes? Okay. When we use open system call to open the file, we can return an integer file descriptor from this function. And flags are just permissions that you assign to these files. For example, file can be open for reading and writing or both. And this information is stored in a file table under the access mode. File table also contains information about offset, reference count, and inode pointer. When a file is open, it's given a unique integer here called the file descriptor or FD for short. File descriptor have their own table inside the Linux kernel right here. The table starts with file descriptor zero and then it keeps growing. The first three file descriptors are taken by standard input, output, and standard arrow. And the rest of them could be used for our files. File descriptor table is a part of the process table on the kernel side. It holds an individual file descriptor table for each process. 
If, for example, we have two processes, we would have two file descriptor tables. So let's just copy the first file descriptor table here and we'll stick the second one right here. When a file is open, the kernel returns a file descriptor to the user space application. So let's just um, show it here. This file descriptor is also used to identify an open file within a process and can be used for subsequent operations on the resource. The same file descriptor number can be used by different processes, but they will refer to different instances of open files in each process. For example, um, if we call this process A and we have another process B running, they can both use file descriptor 3 because they will point to completely different file descriptor tables and different files. They will be identified by unique PID number, so like for example 1 and 2. When a file is open, the kernel assigns a file descriptor and manages the mapping between file descriptors in user space and entries in the file table. Multiple processes can open the same file at once, each with its own key. Okay. But beware, concurrent access can be very unpredictable. It's like dancing a tango with your partner. The moves better be synchronized because you do not want to step on your partner's feet, right? The kernel does not impose any restrictions on concurrent file access, so user space programs must coordinate amongst themselves to ensure that concurrent file accesses are properly synchronized. Okay, and so now we can talk about our regular files. They are the rock stars of the Linux world. A regular file is stored on a persistent storage medium like a disk. The disk would be placed in the hardware section of our diagram. So right here we have it ready. The file's content is stored on the data block. Files are divided into chunks of data blocks, each of which typically holds a fixed number of bytes. For example, we can say four kilobytes each. A regular file contains bytes of data. They organized into a linear array called the byte stream. To optimize this process of reading from and writing to standard files, we can use a buffer in the user space right here. The buffer can be located on a stack or we can also put it in a heap. It is a temporary memory area in user space where data is stored during the file operations. Using a buffer will reduce the number of disks accesses and improves the data handling efficiency. Any byte within a file can be read or written to, starting at the specific byte, known as a file position or file offset. This file position is essential metadata associated with each open file. Initially, the file position is set to zero, and it's increasing as bytes are read and written. The offset operates at a byte stream level but directly influences how data is read from or written to the file. Um, let's look at our two files that we open. Now we can fill our file table for both of them. Let's say we have a write access to the blue file and read and write access to the pink file. Uh, we can have a reference count of 1 for one of the files and 2 for another. Reference count keeps track of how many file descriptors are referring to the same open file description. When a file is open, the kernel creates an inode and assigns it a reference count of 1. Each subsequent file descriptor that refers to the same inode increments this reference count. As you can see, we have an inode pointer in our table as well, right? So um, we can assign an offset of 0 to one file and offset of 6 kilobytes to another file. When you perform a read or write operation at a certain offset, the file system translates this byte stream position into corresponding data blocks on the disk. For example, 
if the file system uses 4 kilobyte blocks, as we discussed before, and your offset is 0, it will start reading from our first data block. But when the offset is 6 kilobytes, the system will read from the second data block, starting 2 kilobytes into the block. To change the offset, we can use LSIC function that takes file descriptor, the offset number, and the type of offset. For example, seek set will set the offset from the beginning of the file. To set the file offset to 6 kilobytes, like we before discussed, um, you need to specify the offset in bytes. Okay, so 1 kilobyte is 1024 bytes and 6 kilobytes um, then would be 6 times 1024, which is 6,144 bytes. Okay, this means that you would use 6,144 as the offset value in the LSIC function. Does it make sense? Okay, the file position can be set manually to any value, even beyond the end of the file. You can write beyond the file by adding bytes with zeros, but you cannot write to a position before the beginning of the file even if you really want to, okay, just don't do that. The size of a file is its length measured in bytes. You can change a file's length through a truncation. If you want to cut it short, just snip, snip all the end. Want to make it longer, add some zeros in the end, and then you can watch it grow. A file may be empty, and it would mean that the length is zero, and there are no valid bytes in it. For our two files, we can imagine that the first file is one kilobyte. When our blocks are four kilobytes each, we can partition it into four sections. So just for visualization. Um, so the first file would fill this part of the data block and the second file is two kilobytes. We said that it has an offset of 6 kilobytes and it starts right here. So then it will fill this part of the data block. As I said before, when file is open, the kernel creates an inode. So files in Linux are actually referenced by inodes, okay? Inodes store all the juicy details like file type. And in our example, we have regular files, so let's just write this down here. It also stores permission for read, write, and execute. And then it stores other information like the size of a file, link count, and block pointer. Um, there is other information like timestamps, owners, and flags that are also part of the table, but we'll just take mental note of it and we won't write them down, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, the block pointers point to the data blocks where the actual content of a file is stored on the disk. So we would have our blue file point to the first data block and then the pink file will point to the second data block. Hey, but guess what? inodes don't care about the file names, they're all about the data. And inode stores all this information, but no file name. Directory entries in the Unix file system maintain the mapping between the human readable file names and their corresponding inodes. Okay, both the inode array and the directory entry that maps a file name to its inode number are stored on the hard drive. The inode array and hardware refers to the on-disk storage structure of inodes. It's a fixed size array that is a part of the file system on the storage device. It contains the metadata for all files and directories in the file system. Each entry in this array corresponds to a unique inode number. The mapping is stored in one of the data blocks dedicated to directory data. Let's just fill our um, data blocks with our text files. Pink text file can be associated with inode 1, and then a blue text file can be associated with inode 2. This mapping 
allows user process to access files by their names rather than having to deal directly with inode numbers. If you notice, we have inode table and we also have inode array and you might think, um, what is the difference between these two? The difference between inode table in the kernel and inode array in the hardware is that inode table in the kernel manages inodes for concurrently active files, this enabling the fast access and management. When inode array, on the other hand, that lives in the hardware, provides persistent storage of file metadata for the entire file system. The, meta, the metadata that we discussed for inode table also stores an inode array. However, the inode table in the kernel also includes additional information such as inode state that indicates whether inode is currently locked, dirty, or in use. And then it also stores a reference count that tracks how many processes currently reference this inode. And then it also stores the file system specific data necessary for managing inodes. I think this completes our picture. It shows how the process of opening a file works in a user space and in a kernel space, as well as what happens on the hardware side when this file is created. Here are key takeaways. Always manage your file descriptors like a pro, then synchronize your processes to avoid chaos and get friendly with inodes for a smooth sailing. Don't forget to watch part two for practical demonstration with some C++ code. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave a comment below with some questions, comments, or any suggestions you might have. And I is signing off for now. Until next time, you stay brilliant and cold with confidence. This is a tech fairy waving goodbye and spreading the tech magic your way. Bye.